Don't worry, I'm not talking about either one of those. <laughs> when I was 11 years old, I had a great opportunity to attend a summer camp for the musically inclined. Now, I'd been to lots of summer camps before, but none of them had really pushed me out of my comfort zone. So there I was, surrounded by a bunch of kids who were destined to tour with, up with people over the next couple years and planned careers in the music industry. There was one camp counselor we all loved. His name was Brett. Now, Brett came to camp with a plan. Brett had written a number of musical compositions and set lyrics to them, and he'd basically written a musical with no dialogue other than singing, and he wanted to produce it at the end of camp. And everyone was excited about it. Everyone auditioned for it, even me. Now, he decided, rather than giving a solo to each person for one song, he broke up the verses. And so a number of people got to sing one verse each with the chorus sitting behind us, supporting us. I got lucky. I got the last verse in the finale. I was psyched. So the final Friday of the camp, an auditorium's filled with the townies, and we come in, and Brett's masterpiece is unfolding, song after song, melody after melody, the meaning building and building, until that finale happens, and we come up to the final verse, and I step forward from the chorus, and promptly forget every word to what I needed to sing. I stared at the audience, wide-eyed, scared, deer in the headlights, for what seemed like forever. But I know it was only two stanzas until I heard everyone jumping in on the chorus behind me and I slinked back into the crowd. The rest of that night was a blur. I remember my mom told me nobody noticed. <laughs> and that consolation rang hollow because I knew everybody had noticed. I had failed. I haven't thought about that night for a long time. I think failure is something we like to repress. Nobody wants to be seen as a failure, which is actually kind of funny, because I don't know anybody who doesn't want to be seen as an innovator in their industry. And we know from talking to people that innovation and failure are intimately tied together. Innovative corporations are tolerant of failure. Innovative cultures are tolerant of failure. Innovative, pick any kind of organization you want, it has to be tolerant of failure. So when we started thinking about building an innovative engineering school here at SMU, we spent a lot of time thinking about failure. And so I started thinking about where does this come from and how do you do this? And I started thinking back to childhood. And so what I wanted to know is where does innovation come from these kids who are growing up in this great culture? And the first thing we came across is, okay, let's look at the school system. Well, unfortunately, Standardized testing raises the stakes for failure, both for students and teachers, far too high. It makes it hard to allow the students to fail and overcome those things in the daily classroom. So a little bit of failure, helping us learn how to innovate in school, may not be where it's coming from. I said, okay, it's not coming from school. Let's think about home. Certainly, the nurturing, caring, loving environment of our homes is where we learn to overcome failure. And so I talked to a lot of people about these things. And I really came down to finding two truths that always came out. The first one was, as parents, we don't like our kids to see us fail. We would do almost anything to avoid someone we love seeing us fail. I talked to a mom, a mom who bickered with her teenage daughter through all of her teenage years, and the argument would go something like, but mom, I'm not perfect like you. I just can't do it that way. You're so perfect. You've never had these troubles. And after the discussion, the mom had tears in her eyes and swore to me she was going to go home and share her failures with her daughter because she'd never told her that she too had struggled growing up. And if she wanted her to pick up the pieces and be able to move forward, she had to let her know that she'd done it herself. Thing number two, we try anything we can to make sure our children don't fail. We don't want someone we love to go through that bitter taste of failure. Think back to the last school project. The last school project, maybe it was a car. Are the wheels round enough? Is there enough friction? Is it balanced in the right way? We try to make so sure that that's going to be a success. I talked to one father 
for a third grade weaving project that his daughter had to go in and talk about in school, he said he had gone into his wood shop and built a vintage loom, stained it, polished it, wired it up. It was now a proud piece of furniture in his living room for a third grade weaving assignment. Well, here's the thing. If we never let our children see us fail, and we never let them experience a little failure for themselves, how are they ever going to learn to pick themselves up, pat off the dust, and try again and again and again and again until they really succeed? If we love them that much, we've really got to let them fail sometimes. So I wish I could tell you that SMU is a place where Failing happens all the time, and it's wonderful. But the reality is, if you fail enough things at FSMU, you're going to get a letter from an academic dean telling you to stop that, or you're not coming back next semester. So we had to find a way to build a failure-tolerant environment in the Lyle Engineering School. And we did, and it's the Decent Innovation Gymnasium. It is a place where if you can dream it, if you can think it, you can go there and make it. No grades are assigned in that space, and students take on audacious goals that they would never try if there was a grade riding on it. I think there's three key things to the success of that space. The first is the tooling. This is a 3D printer, for those of you who haven't seen it. The little Yoda head was printed in it. The Nerf lightsaber was an accessory we tacked on later. <laughs> we have laser cutters, 3D printers, hand tools, wood shop tools, anything to be able to help you make whatever you would dream of. Thing number two in the innovation gym has to do with culture. This is a mural that hangs up over the director's office. My favorite pieces of this, this was painted by students thinking about what it meant to be in an innovative environment, is a statement and a corollary. The statement is the spirit of the innovation gym. This may not work. And the corollary is why it's such a popular place. But won't it be really cool if it does? The third thing that's in the innovation gym is a cheerleader, a coach, a counselor, somebody to support the students, pick them up, dust them off, nudge them in the right direction, let them fail and learn how to overcome it. That's Greg Needell, the director. He was here earlier. I don't know if he's in here right now. Greg pushes these students to do absolutely amazing things. He does it over year-long innovation competitions with students all across campus, and he does it in these, get this, 10-day immersion design experiences. 240 hours from the moment they hear the idea to the moment they demonstrate it for the customer. There's no time for failing in that. You go right up to the edge, you go beyond your edge. They start at 18-hour days and then work up from there. I've sat through some of them. In the last three days, nobody gets any sleep. But they have done some really amazing things. They have built. Oh, I hit the wrong button. They have built drone aircraft to fight forest fires, pirate defense systems from a Somalia merchant marine vessels, a trunk full of GPS-guided amateur rockets, a design for the world's largest toy tower to be breaking the world record this fall at the, at the National Building Museum. Amazing things happen in this space. I've seen it again and again. And remember, they don't get a grade, they don't get paid, they do it for the sheer enjoyment of pushing themselves to the limit and seeing what they can do. Now, I know it's working, and I know it's been working since the very first one of these IDEs. The very first one was that remote control drone helicopter that put out forest fires. It was built by a number of early career engineering students. The electrical engineer who worked on it hadn't even taken a class in microcontrollers yet. So he solved it like a homework problem. He built it out of discrete parts. And that part up there in the corner is a relay. It's the thing that turned on the motor to let the pump unfurl and put the hose down in the swimming pool. So the idea was the drone would fly out over a swimming pool, unfurl its hose until the hose touched the water, pump up water into a baffle until the baffle was full, pull up the hose, fly over by GPS to the fire, and dump the water on it. Pretty cool idea. 80% of the time, it worked. 
But 20% of the time, there wasn't quite enough juice to throw that relay to wind the pump up, and the helicopter would go dragging its hose out of the swimming pool. <laughs> when they demonstrated it for Frank Capuccio, the head of the skunk works, it worked, and that was amazing. But what I really found amazing was a semester later, when that student was sitting in his next electrical engineering class, and the professor was lecturing on amplifier circuits, and the student saw something on the board at the end of class, pulled out his cell phone, took a picture of his notebook, and texted the innovation gym director saying, I know how to solve that problem we had with the servo. I'm coming over this afternoon to tape out a new board. He had not only rewired the circuit in the drone aircraft, he had rewired the way he thought about learning. He was in the classroom wondering how he could use, engage, apply every piece of knowledge that was there. It raised the bar for him, all of his fellow classmates, and frankly, for the faculty standing at the front of the room. This is truly an engaged learning process. These incidents where you push yourself to the limits of failure fundamentally change the way you think and have a life-lasting impact. So 30 years ago, on the next night, when we took the stage to perform for the very last time, as I stepped out from the chorus back into that spotlight, the verse was etched into my brain. Well, people mourn the loss of the mountain man. I know everything is okay. Because when I look to the mountain, I see that old man. He's saying, faith took me on my way. My son, your faith will take you on your way. I didn't end up with a singing career, but it's still etched in there. <laughs> Failure. Don't be it. Just do it. Thank you. <laughs>